Iran will pay. That is the message from Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu after the Iranians launched a deadly missile attack against Israel. The IDF says about 180 missiles were fired at Israel, many of them intercepted. But a few got through, killing at least one person and injuring several others. Celebrations breaking out in the streets of Tehran moments after the rocket attacks subsided. The world now waiting to see how Israel will respond. Iran Iran made a big mistake tonight, and it will pay for it. The regime in Iran does not understand our determination to defend ourselves and our determination to retaliate against our enemies. We will stand by the rule we established. Whoever attacks us, we will attack him. Iran's armed forces chief of staff is missing that warning. He says Israel should prepare for more strikes if it continues aggression. If the Zionist regime that has gone crazy is not controlled by America and Europe and wants to continue these crimes or wants to do anything against our sovereignty and territorial integrity, tonight's operation will be repeated several times stronger and all their infrastructure will be targeted. CNN political and national security analyst David Sanger, also, of course, longtime New York Times correspondent, joins us now. David, uh, honestly, there's no one I would rather talk to um, on a morning like this as the world waits uh, for to find out uh, what Israel is going to do here. Uh, and I was just reading uh, your piece uh, in The Times, um, and I, I actually wanted to, to ask you, I mean, it, it seems like the, the question about how Israel is going to retaliate here does seem to come down to, I mean, there were several um, Israeli officials that were on with my colleague Wolf Blitzer uh, last night, Naftali Bennett, former prime minister, Michael Oren, uh, the uh, former Israeli uh, ambassador to Washington, uh, and they both had pretty hawkish things to say about Israel seizing this moment to take on uh, an attack, frankly, the Iranian nuclear facilities. And you write in your piece that that is something that Benjamin Netanyahu, the prime minister, has been looking for an opening to potentially do for many years. Do you think that is on the table here? And what does that mean in terms of escalation? Well, I think it's on the table, Casey. I'm not sure they're going to go that far. And certainly the Biden administration is urging them not to. Well, let's just step back for a moment. The wider war that we were trying, that we spent the past year trying to avoid, it's here. It's upon us, right? I mean, what, what it meant was don't spread the uh, Gaza war, the war against Hamas uh, elsewhere. And now, of course, we have seen um, Israel go after Hezbollah, kill its leader, We've seen um, Israeli attacks and our uh, Houthi attack on Israel and an Israeli counterattack. And now we have seen for the second time in six months, Iran uh, uh, sending missiles directly at Israel. They had not really done that since the 1979 Iranian revolution. So on all fronts, we're there. And then the question is, does um, Prime Minister Netanyahu choose this moment to escalate further and take out what's the true long-term threat to Israel, which of course is the nuclear program, or does he say, this is gonna get us on a cycle we can't stop? And that's the administration's view. And frankly, that's the decision I think we'll know about in the next 24 to 48 hours. Really interesting. And, and David, you write this, uh, you note, of course, that American f officials believe they can persuade Mr. Netanyahu to make his point without setting off a full-blown war. But they concede, you write, that the Israeli prime minister may see the next five weeks until the American presidential election as a right moment to try to set that program back by years. After all, former President Donald J. Trump would not complain about a major attack on Iran's military infrastructure, and Democrats cannot, be af uh, cannot afford to be accused of restraining Israel after Tuesday's missile attack. Uh, can you uh, explain a little bit more about how this interacts with the presidential campaign? Sure. You know, in the, in the past dynamic, whenever Netanyahu has threatened to strike the Iranian program, and two or three times he's come very close to doing that over the past decade or so, and always held back, the U.S. has always urged caution. They said there are diplomatic options here. 
the cost of striking could include nuclear um, uh, uh, pollution around uh, around Iran. It's a really bad precedent to set. Let's find some other ways to restrain a program, especially since the Iranians don't seem to be right on top of building a weapon. But now, who's going to go say that? Certainly not Donald Trump, who uh, pulled out of the Iranian nuclear accord and has threatened the Iranians at various moments, and who the Iranians have sent out people to try to assassinate him and broken into his campaign. So no love lost there. And I think for Vice President Harris, it's a really tricky time. If she said after a missile attack like this, really the Israelis should should pair back on this, you can imagine how the Republicans would, would leap on her. So he probably thinks he's got a few weeks pass until the election. All right, let's go live to Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, where we find former U.S. Defense Secretary Mark Esper. Uh, Mr. Secretary, very grateful to have you on this uh, critical morning as we all wait to see morning, how Casey. Israel is going to respond to this. Uh, can you give me a sense of what your view is about the best way for them to move forward? Because we've seen uh, some rhetoric from uh, Israeli, former Israeli officials like Naftali Bennett told my colleague Wolf Blitzer yesterday that Israel should seize this opportunity to strike Iranian nuclear facilities. Uh, do you think that's a good idea? And is there any way to walk back from the brink? Well, clearly yesterday's strike by Iran was significant, but also feckless. Uh, they shot over 180 missiles, and none of them hit their mark in terms of killing anybody, thank goodness, or, or causing a lot of damage. And so it was a, a very significant attack, once again proven feckless. Uh, the issue now, of course, is what does Israel do to, in response? And I feel that they will respond. They're not going to uh, do what they did the last time in April uh, because uh, uh, Iran had crossed that threshold. I think also that the strategic environment with regard to the region has changed significantly as well. Uh, back in April, of course, uh, Ishmael Hanai was still in charge of Hamas. The, the war in Gaza was still ongoing. In, in uh, southern Lebanon with Hezbollah, you had um, uh, Nasrallah still in charge and his leadership. But now those two entities, that leadership structure, those leaders are completely gone. And the concern that Israel might have had in the past that responding um, boldly back uh, uh, to Iran might uh, cause Hezbollah to strike from their northern flank, that seems to be not the case anymore. So I expect uh, Israel w will respond. The question is, what type of targets will they strike? Will they go inside Iran after nuclear sites, after ballistic missile production sites, or will they go outside Iran in the Persian Gulf, for example, and, and attack oil infrastructure, attack oil rigs? Uh, that remains to be seen. Uh, Mr. Secretary, do you think there's any possibility for a negotiated ceasefire deal in the region at that point? We seemed close to it uh, not that long ago. Well, we've had a couple of different proposals, right? We had the one uh, in Gaza, which has been rejected multiple times by Hamas. And uh, of course, uh, Gaza is not the focus right now. You had one proposed by the Biden administration uh, a few days ago, a week ago, a 21 day, day ceasefire, but Israel had different plans. And at this point, They've been successful again in decimating uh, Hamas's leadership, knocking out their command and control, and now are on the cusp of an incursion to go after a lot of the infrastructure on the border. So I don't know that, frankly, it's in um, uh, Israel's interest at this point to have a ceasefire, and, and maybe not for the United States' interest as well. When you've got terrorist organizations across the region on their back foot uh, and, and decimated, maybe now is the time to press that advantage and, uh, and, 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 and make sure you take out more of that infrastructure so you remove these threats. I do think the one thing that is out there that's pending, you hear uh, some in the region talking about it, that is a reintroduction of UN Resolution 1701, which you, you may recall was passed uh, after the last conflict between Hezbollah and Israel in 2006. That called for Israel after the conflict to move south of the, uh, of the Lebanese border and then for Hezbollah to move north of the, of the uh, Lebanese border about 18 miles. Hezbollah never lived up to its end of the bargain. And so now the question is, if Israel goes in, removes infrastructure, uh, can you get a more concrete agreement about Hezbollah staying back from the border, maybe up along the Tani River, 18 miles away, uh, and, and thus prevent what has been going on now for 11 months with Hezbollah nearly daily striking targets in Israel? 